It's uh, extremely exciting to have this panel on uh, the tipping point of corporate venturing. Uh, I, the first time I ever went to Silicon Valley, by coincidence, I was uh, reading uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book. And ever since then, I've sort of always sort of had, a, had it in the brain uh, that there's a tipping point going on in corporate venturing. So, uh, the, um, firstly, uh, be great if you could go sort of introducing yourselves from left to right. Yes, thank you, Toby, and thanks for having us here. My name is Bo Ilser. I'm a managing partner at Nuke Growth Partners. We manage about $700 million in various funds across the world. We're present in Europe. US, China, and India, and uh, we invest generally within the uh, strategic interest sphere of Nokia, but as an arm's length, uh, traditionally structured venture capital investor. Uh, good morning, my name is John Lochner. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for General Motors. I'm responsible for two things. Uh, one, our research and development organization that we have in-house. And also, I run our venture capital subsidiary, GM Ventures. And we can talk about how those two relate to one another because they're very interrelated. Hi, I'm George Coyle. I manage ConocoPhillips Technology Ventures Investments. And uh, we're the largest independent EMP company in the world. And we're using venture capital as a tool to accelerate commercialization of those technologies that can improve our core performance as well as improve our sustainability and make sure that we have a, a view of what's coming next. Yep, yeah, my name is Ralf Schnell. I'm heading uh, Siemens Venture Capital. Uh, we are part of um, our division financial services and we are understanding ourselves as a service organization to the, uh, uh, to the Siemens organization in uh, helping them getting access to external innovation. As a second job, we also managing our uh, pension assets on the private equity side. So, I think the, the sort of evidence that, that sort of made us think that the tipping point was a sort of sensible theme for uh, this symposium was that sort of we, we've tracked a doubling in the size of um, corporates doing venturing. So we, we think there are roughly 1,200 units worldwide doing some form of investing in startups. And the, as, as you will have seen very briefly from sort of Jim slides the the sort of uh, the numbers are very much sort of up and to the right in corporate venturing. It sort of looks like the singularity um, uh, or the start of it, hopefully. Um, so, what um, do you sort of think here uh, among the panel? Uh, what's driving this? Why why are we sort of why is the, why is corporate venturing sort of uh, ticking up so much? Yes, yeah, so uh, T Toby, I, I, I agree very much. It's not a question of that we have hit the tipping point. I, I think clearly also the evidence in this room today and, and uh, uh, what has happened the last five years, we have really seen a, a sort of watershed of, of movement into venture forms by corporates. And, and uh, uh, Nokia has been committed to this since the late 90s, have committed more than one and a half billion dollars over the years to various forms of venturing activities. Um, clearly, the uh, very, very rich balance sheets of many corporates are accelerating this. Uh, we saw some of the exponential numbers also in, in some of the growth. We are clearly at a phase where there is a lot of market exuberance, right? So I think also here we, that, that that's one one big driver. I think the the second big driver is, and and I think Nokia is one of the prime examples of a company that completely missed a wave or missed the boat on a big trend in a market where Nokia was a leader, and and I think there is a a, a very strong and growing recognition that innovation also has to come from the outside because companies get set in their systems, they get stuck by their customers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think those two factors, the, the very healthy balance sheets and then also a, a, a strong and growing recognition that innovation has to also come from the outside in. And John, what do you sort of make of all the sort of vibrant activity? Yeah, I think uh, Rohit talked a little bit about it in his remarks about a lot of new technology is on the horizon. Some of it's already available today, more to come. 
And the question of, that any organization has to ask itself is, do we have the capability on all of the various fronts that are, that are emerging? Do we have the internal capability to do all of those things ourselves the way we may have done it some years ago? Or does it make sense to treat uh, startup companies as an additional source of innovation, additional source of technology, either to augment the capability of the company or to take the company in brand new directions? And I think that's a big piece of why corporates are in it today. I would also observe, though, that um, the whole world went through a pretty significant downturn between 2007 and 2009. You see the lingering effects of that today in various geographies around the world. Um, and when you put that together, one of the first things that corporations tend to do is they tend to look at all of their expenses as they hunker down and try to make it through a downturn. And one of those is research and development. It doesn't go to zero, but on the margin, it gets trimmed. And depending on what type of research and development you're talking about, it can get trimmed a lot. And so corporations going through that whole thing get to the other side and they say, hey, you know, we got to pick up the pace here. We got to get back on track to where we would have been. And because those things were not necessarily happening inside the enterprise, uh, corporations will look to find places where it was happening and has happened to make sure that they have access to the kind of technologies that are going to be important in the next five to ten years. And, and George, in, in some ways, I think you could play a bit of sort of a devil's advocate on this panel just because the, the, the sort of oil industry has, has gone through a bit of turbulence lately. Sort of how, how do you sort of see um, that sort of price change affecting activity in your sector? I, I think it's pretty critical. I mean, if you think about what we've just gone through with our product being cut in half, it it's actually plays well into having a corporate venture capital group in the sense that we need to be the lowest cost supplier of our product in order to survive. You've got to drive that down and technology is the way that you're gonna do that. And then sourcing that innovation at the lowest cost to delivering a commercial technology that can improve your operations is critical. And so what we've seen is when we compare classic R&D in order to drive a technology that could potentially lower our pr production and operating costs, uh, we're seeing the outcomes from our corporate venture capital providing a much lower cost of delivering a commercial technology that can be supported you know, 365 days a year across the globe versus our internal R&D and trying to drive that back out to it. So we see this as part of our tool to, to be a low cost producer by also delivering the technologies at the lowest overall cost. And, and Ralph, um, we, we've talked a bit in the past about sort of how um, it does seem there's a bit of over exuberance out there with, with the sort of development of the unicorns and, and these kind of things. What, what do you make of um, all these multi-billion dollar companies? Can they, can they all be that? I, we'll see that. Uh, and uh, uh, Bo mentioned it already, and uh, uh, um, there's that nice wording from Robert Schiller and, and Alan Greenspan of irrational exuberance. I do think that that's a nice phrase of uh, not talk, uh, calling it a bubble. But I do think there's something in, on, on that end. By the way, this is not only for the venture business, that's not only for the private equity business, it's the same you, uh, you see in the public market. Mm -hmm. The public market index is uh, uh, the cyclical uh, uh, um, corrected uh, PEs, uh, the fourth highest since uh, uh, they are recorded. Mm -hmm. They were, were higher in 29, they were higher in uh, in, in 2000 and they were higher in 2007, but no, uh, at no other point in time. Hmm. Uh, so that's a general trend. And what actually, this uh, front page of the Financial Times today is uh, that there is uh, um, a record uh, M&A. So, so it's, it's even bigger than 2007, even bigger than 2000. Mm -hmm. How's that playing out in the sort of venturing world? What's, what's, what's sort of happening there in terms of, what, is, there a cor is, is it sort of correlated? What, what's going on? I, I think you see the, uh, the same behavior maybe in a, a little bit smaller scale than some of the mega deals, but, but uh, clearly again, uh, corporates with large balance sheets if, if they don't want to give the money back to so the shareholders, they need to find ways to do it. And of course, often uh, uh, it is then to maybe consolidate your industry, and that's what 
we see across a lot of sectors. And Nokia Alcatel losing this is one example of that. We've seen the semiconductor deals. Now I'm talking technology, but but broadly across, obviously, again, uh, lots of money sitting on the balance sheets and, and corporate managers trying to think what they can do rather than just hand it back to shareholders, which is driving that. And then, obviously, the very low interest rate environment, right? That's that's the other thing that, that there's, there's cash available and, and uh, you can't put it in a bank or in a treasury bill, right? Or you can, but it's it's close to zero return. So those, those are, I think we see spilling over into the venture, venture world as well. And um, John, what, what do you sort of make of um, all these groups sort of coming into this market environment? So, so there's a lot of new entrants out there. You were teaching our academy yesterday. Sort of how, how should they be thinking about sort of people trying to get their head around what's going on in Silicon Valley, what's going on in innovation? What should they make of all this? How should they approach it? Well, I, I think corporate venturing definitely has a role, but, but each company has to think through what they're actually trying to accomplish. Um, it wasn't so long ago that there were a lot of corporates that were seeking financial returns. Um, and that was the primary reason why they had a corporate venturing organization, was it was all about financial returns and using corporate venturing as a way to make money. And sure enough, there's a way to make money in corporate venturing, no doubt about it. Um, but for a lot of companies, including ours, there has to be something more to it. Um, if it's just about making money, then there are public markets, there are a lot of places that a reasonably sophisticated corporation can deploy its money moving in and out of various investments. And so if it's all about making money, I'm not sure locking your money up in a, in a startup company for five or more years makes a lot of sense. The way we look at it, it's really all about innovation. It's all about developing advanced technology or at least having access to advanced technology. And that's the so what. Yeah, we have to be financially prudent in doing that. You can't spray money in every direction and expect to be in, in, a, in a business um, of corporate venturing very long, but there has to be a so what that makes money to, uh, that makes sense to the enterprise. Whether it's supporting a core business or growing a new business, these are the kinds of things that, that make a lot of sense for, um, at least in my opinion, make a lot of sense for a corporate venturing activity. But you have to be thoughtful about how you're gonna structure it and where you're gonna focus um, the investments that you do make so that you guarantee that there is, at least you try to guarantee that there is, a return to the enterprise that's not just in dollars and cents, but it's really about growing the enterprise. Again, whether it's supporting a core business or growing a new business, it has to have some foundation that makes sense to the company as a whole. Hmm. And George, what, what, what's sort of your advice for people trying to make their um, their corporate venturing sustainable and ensuring that they don't get caught up in euphoria and sure i think i think it's really important that you understand what it is what your vision is and that you can communicate it up within your corporation so kind of to his point you know we're here in in, in our case we're able to clearly say we want to be the largest and best customers of the companies that we invest in because we want to invest in things that we think make a step or game change improvement in our performance. And we can articulate that up the line and our senior management knows that we care about ConocoPhillips and its performance and therefore when we make an investment we're looking for gaps that we're trying to fill with that external technology. So you need to be really clear on that and have that alignment because ultimately even if you have great financial returns you need the support of senior management through the tough times in order to continue to be funded and going forward. So they, they need to know that you're very aware of your corporation's core business, where those gaps are, and how you're trying to fill them. And or if you have the job of screening new businesses for them, you need to be able to articulate that. So it's that clear vision. I think the other thing is you have to make sure that they truly understand and have expectations around what it is you're gonna be do, so they understand that it's lumpy. You need to communicate and educate that constantly upward. We're a lumpy cycle, we're not, you know, Deploying a certain amount of capital each year is not exactly the most efficient way to be a good corporate venture capitalist. You've got to remember that, hey, follow-ons are very important to the companies that you support. We have co-investors. We expect high financial return. 
And we've got to make sure that if we're partnering with somebody, that we're there through the tough times as well as the, the good times. In case in point, we had a company that just did really well in M&A, but it, it moved out of the oil and gas. It was much more valuable in the ag space, but it needed, say, some follow-on funding. You need to make that last bit to help the company get where it's going and support your co-investors, or they won't be co-investing with you in the future. So those are some of the expectations you need to make sure and set ahead of time. And, and Ralph, how do you win those battles in, in a corporate? Because sometimes I, I hear that, that sort of corporate officers can say, ah, well, it's not strategic, why are we funding it? Kind of sort of thing. Uh, we don't do these things, yeah. first of all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, first of all, it's a, it's an expect, uh, it's a question of uh, managing expectations for, for top management. The whole thing uh, 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 lives and dies uh, with top management, be it top management of Siemens or uh, the divisions or whatsoever. The people who give the money, uh, we're not working with, uh, we're working with the money of the corporation, the money of division X, Y, that. And they should have an understanding why they give us the money. Uh, that's the first thing. Then we are very much align our, uh, uh, our way of going into the market with their interest. Uh, in a very, very systematic and outspoken process because every CEO from a division has to cross-sign uh, the search areas that we go into. So we have the commitment from them that they are interested in it. Um, yeah, and, and, and we are financing business partners. That's our, uh, our, our in, in a nutshell, that's what we are doing. We're not doing venture capital or growth equity. We do all of that. Uh, uh, we even do pipe or whatsoever we can do mezzanine. Uh, we, we have the full flexibility. That's not the important thing. The important thing, we are financing business partners and potential business partners. We want to strengthen the business relationship or, and we want to strengthen, strengthen our business partners because they typically in the growth phase uh, need money. That's what we do. And in order to achieve that, we apply a variety of financing tools. And, and within Siemens um, Financial Services, where you sit, you, you have a, quite a complex task. So you have to sort of manage uh, 10 masters, I think, so 10 sort yeah. of divisions. Yeah. How, do you, how do you keep them all happy? Uh, in, in fact, I have, I have 11, in, uh, no, uh, 12 internal customers, uh, two pension trusts, and 10 divisions. Yeah. And I get the money from all of them, and, and uh, I have to make them happy. Uh, we are currently running a net promoter scoring exercise. We do that uh, as many others do it, and we do that internally. We, there's an independent organization uh, that calls our customers and asks them how happy they are with us, and then they can tell us uh, what they like and what they don't like. And then the next budgeting process comes, and then the next strategic discussion comes with the CEOs and this, uh, uh, the people in the strategy departments. What do we do next? And Bo, you, you have quite a sort of intriguing structure as well. So you, you've got a sort of LP, GP um, structure at, at, at Nokia. Why that, the sort of argument is it tends to make you sort of more, more financially or, orientated to sort of John's earlier point, how do you sort of get that strategic value for Nokia or does that not concern you? Yeah, so it, it always concerns us because when we're going to ask for the next fund, we, we like to demonstrate to our LP that we have created some value for them. So obviously, it always concerns us. I think we've been at it for 10 years, and, and, and I think most, most people here in the room have in public seen the gyrations that Nokia have been through the last 10 years. Uh, we have lived through three CEOs and three CFOs, and, and we're still around, and I think part of the reason why we're still around is that we're financially orientated and, and we have been fortunate enough to also generate financial returns. So even in times where you have to lay off 20, 30,000 people as a CFO and then you're looking at your venture activity and you see that it's actually a profitable business for you, it's a lot simpler discussion, right? So I think when, when, when companies have these gyrations, our model, which is more financially centric, but and, and also with you, you would say less sort of involvement or control from the from our LP, is is a way to to establish longevity in the business as well. Um, and then I think it's it's really up to 
like, like Ralph has 12 internal customers, right? Really working with the business units and groups across your organization in, in collaboration around project segments, investment areas, and then identifying companies. And, and I think most people, once we start working with them, they understand that, well, there might be 10 partners, for instance, in a project. Maybe one of those companies is investable for a reason or another, right? Either the, 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 the management team is some, some, somebody you can back. Maybe the pricing is, 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 is in the right air, domain, in, in the right range. So, so of course, there are a number of reasons why we will not necessarily invest, even though Nokia may do a partnership with a company. But often we also find the, the intersection where there is a partnership developing and we believe it's a, it's a potentially profitable investment over the years. But it's, it's, a, different, it's a different model and, and it's more arm's length. But for us, it, it, at least we have seen that it has given us the longevity really to, to have this model, even in times where our LP have been going through a lot of changes. And um, just sort of on the, you've been also, Bo, riding uh, um, the, the, the sort of China dragon in some ways. So the, the sort of, uh, you've had two very big exits there. Sort of, what's it like participating in that market? Which so, so I think the, the, so we invest globally. We, we have presence in the four regions, China, India, US, and Europe. And, and obviously that allows us to also not completely exit a market at a time where it's more daunting to invest. Mm. And, and I, I, those of you who are active in India, you have seen, for instance, in the last 12 months, people are rolling into India with billion dollar commitments to put into India. And, and uh, uh, in our experience, investing there is, is very hard because once the tide turns, a lot of money disappears from the market and, and you really have to think through how can you stay through these downturns in a, in a market like, like India. Uh, China, we, we invested a lot in 2009 and 2010, and of course now we regret that we didn't invest more, but, but, but uh, we have been part of a, a couple of billion, billion dollar exits in China, and, and the Chinese market itself, of course, can carry these exits. And, when we started in, in, in investing there, we were concerned about exits because either you don't get out or then you have to go public in NASDAQ. That was five years ago and we have seen now, of course, there's a very vibrant also local M&A market developing that, that you can capitalize on as an investor. And uh, John, George and Ralph actually sort of... Uh you, you've all seen a bit of a, um, the, the sort of fallout of the, the change in the clean tech cycle, which went yeah. from very sort of hyped to slightly uh, more moribund. And um, the sort of, what, how did you, because to some extent you've all kept investing in adjacent sectors, George a bit more oil and gas, but it's sort of making the oil and gas industry more efficient and a lot of financial VCs even pulled out there. How, what, what did you make of that sort of change? Um, I, I would say there, there's no doubt there's been a big fall off in clean tech. Um, I think for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, um, it got overhyped. And you see these hype cycles. In fact, there's uh, one, it's called the Gartner hype cycle. And they actually publish a hype cycle to show where various technologies are along the hype cycle. And, uh, and, and, it's, and it's great to look at. I encourage you to take a look at it because you'll see some things on that chart that square up pretty, pretty well with what you see going on. And clean tech is one of those that just got away. Um, the other thing is some of these technologies are extremely sophisticated and it's very difficult to get to the bottom of whether the technology is going to work or not how it's going to scale, what its relative cost is going to be, and so on and so forth. And um, it doesn't pay to wander into those areas spraying money around in various technologies with some dim understanding of how long it's going to take to get the thing commercialized and how it's actually going to pan out. And unfortunately, there were a lot of things that got funded in clean tech that shouldn't have got funded. Um, and now you see the wreckage, which has been considerable. By the way, we still like clean tech. In fact, it's, it's a terrific place to be because the valuations are quite reasonable for clean tech companies these days. Uh, companies that are working as uh, software as a service 
hey, those valuations are sky high, right? Everybody loves those companies today because they're relatively cheap investments, relatively short number of uh, funding, uh, funding rounds, um, and to a certain extent, if a company gets into, a, a startup gets into something like that, uh, and they can get some customers going, they can get a little pay-as-you-go kind of thing going on with this. So these, these companies' software as a service are very attractive to investors these days. Um, sometimes I ask myself if it's so easy to create a company around something like that, uh, that typically means there are low barriers to entry and low barriers to exit. And if you think about that carefully and look around, you'll see an awful lot of duplication in various sectors. Uh, I'll give you an example, it's a favorite of mine, which is car sharing. I would guess there's a hundred car sharing companies around the world. Uh, Lyft and, and Uber are ob obviously the most noteworthy among them, but there's a hundred out there, at least a hundred, all prosecuting largely the same kind of model or a very similar kind of model. At some point in time, that's got to shake out, okay? Um, and Unfortunately, part of the reason why there's 100 companies out there is because the barriers to get into the business and the barriers to exit the business are relatively low, and so they're no surprise a lot of people that are looking to get into it. Um, some of the companies that have been into it are now getting out of it. Um, so we'll see how that whole thing goes. But there's no doubt that maybe there's a, a, a sentiment that the market as a whole, the, the venture capital market as a whole, is overheated to a certain extent. I would say if you look sector by sector, you'll see some that that is definitely the case. <coughs> you'll see others like clean tech and some of the ones around, uh, you know, around microprocessors and so on and so forth. Um, the valuations are still very reasonable and it's easy to find good companies there or I shouldn't say easy, but relatively straightforward to find good companies there because there aren't so many takers these days. Yeah, there's no doubt that, in uh, at least in, in my business, in the oil and gas business, a lot of the corporate venture capital groups started with an alternative energy swing. But back to your sustainability, if you're not improving the core business, you're not as sustainable. So I'd say almost to a T, they've all, while they still have that bent, all work towards uh, technology that improved the core business. I think within clean tech, like you said, obviously the valuations were down. We never thought of it as clean tech. We always called it energy tech, but it solves a problem. For us, if you're truly going to have a scalable solution that solves some of these world's biggest problems, they have to be profitable. So one of the ones we've worked on uh, is still going strong. As a matter of fact, it should be coming up right now as one of the first ever full-scale commercial profitable CO2 capture plants that is uh, it's actually CO2 capture and reuse rather than uh, sequestration and that project's coming up in San Antonio, Texas and it's going to be profitable so it should be able to be deployed at scale. That's really yeah, I think the, the clean tech space was never ever a homogeneous space. Uh, the clean tech was an artificial construction uh, I'd say, and what have we done, or what are we doing in clean tech? Energy efficiency, still a very, very valid scheme. Smart grid, absolutely something that we need to be in. Uh, at some point in time, we did uh, we did some uh, few deals in in in, in lighting, uh, still still a valid uh, case there. We were happy that we, I think we, in the course of the last five to six years, we screened more than 100 um, solar panel companies. Uh, uh, we never invested in any of them because we made the models and we made the models under the assumption, I'm coming out of the semi-industry, I've seen what, 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 what Moore's Law tells us on the pricing there with DRAMs and so on, and we, see, we saw it on the... Uh, on the flat panel uh, scheme, and now we see the same thing on the solar panels, and we said that never works out uh, sustainable. Uh, but there is a couple of things we are not calling that. We don't need to call it clean tech because the 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 the, the, the name clean tech was never ever very helpful, honestly. Uh, uh, um, but there's a, a lot of spaces, and uh, uh, as uh, as I mentioned, not to forget the uh, electric car infrastructure space. A lot of that is software, and that mm -hmm. is still valid, and it's still important. Uh, um, and even that is not cheap, by the way. <laughs> there's, there's in clean tech areas, they're not cheap. No. And so what, what, what do you think uh, is sort of hot? Where, where are you sort of focusing over the next 12, 24 months? Is there anything that sort of uh, is really exciting you at the moment, Bo? Yeah, we, we want to find the spaces that are not hot. 
No, <laughs> 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 but frankly, that's, I mean, our, our, what, what we're talking a lot about in our team at the moment is, is how, how do we make smart investments in solid businesses that can withstand the downturn and that are priced at a level where, I mean, we believe is, is reasonable. And I'm not saying it has to be cheap. We don't mind paying up for the right companies. But, but we're really, uh, at the moment, very focused on businesses that are either funded well enough that can withstand the downturn or has a business model. And we, actually, we made a great investment in a lighting company out of Boston, uh, which has a very solid business model. It's a, it's a B2B LED-based lighting company. So, so those kind of things we, we are at the moment looking for. And then you take a portfolio approach, right? You may take one or two beds that are a little bit more in the, in the hot sectors. And we're, we're coming to the end of our session. So just sort of in one word answers, what are you working on over the next, uh, uh, what, what's your view of the next 12 months? It, where, where's it gonna go, up, down, sideways? Well, I, I think corporate venturing will probably go up a bit because you've got a lot of new corporates that are coming on board and they're going to bring money, so up. I think in my specific sector, 2015 is going to be hunker down, get through it, and keep your companies uh, solid through this period. So it's, for me, within energy, it's going to be flat to moderately up. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, well, with that, Bo, you want the final one? I, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, in our sector, it's, it's going to be uh, probably flat, maybe slightly up, but really decided, I think, a lot by also global interest rates. I mean. Very good. Great. Well, a warm round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.